thinking about advanced disease mm-hmm. and, um, you know, how do you, you know, what is your strategy for patient selection in the clinic? Like when you've got somebody before you in the frontline space, how do you strategize? And then we'll talk about sort of what to do in the second line space. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think, uh, I sort of have my internal algorithm for how I sort of approach things with the caveat that I think there's still a lot of unknowns. And a lot of this is based on a little bit of data and a lot of anecdote, and there's certainly room for debate. Um, but I, I think my approach has been, um, you know, the, first of all, in the patient in front of me, is this, there's obviously patient-specific factors, like comorbidities, their preference. So all these things have to be taken into account. But for many of patients in front of me, I, I ask the question, is this truly a, a widespread metastatic disease, or is this something that's more of an oligometastatic picture? And if it's more oligometastatic picture, my first sort of branch point is to think about locally directed therapies, surgery, radiation ablation, these sorts of things. Because if you can render a patient NED with locally directed therapies, there's a subset of those patients who will do very well. And that depends on the number of sites, but also kind of the trajectory, whether it's rapidly growing disease or whether this is, you know, 10 years after the primary, there's a singular recurrence that you can deal with locally directed therapy. So that's kind of one branch point. The second is uh, whether this is clear cell or one of the variant histologies. And obviously this individual variants like RMC or collecting duct that really have a totally tr- different treatment paradigm. But even I, I think my, my thinking does shift between something like a papillary uh, it's certainly a chromophobe compared to a clear cell, just as I think of a pure IO-based approach versus uh, non-pure IO-based approach. But for most clear cell patients in front of me, um, the next thing I assess is, for lack of a better term, um, what is the, the rate of disease growth? And in my mind, I'm thinking, is there some sort of impending visceral crisis? Because the question I'm asking is, am I thinking of the long term? where I am hoping this patient, if they, if they respond, they might have a reasonable chance of being in response two, three, five years later down the line, or do I need a response right now? If this patient doesn't respond in the next six, eight, 12 weeks, is it actually in the threat of their life in some way in the, in the really in the short term? And that helps me to, to think a little bit of between IO, IO-based approaches and IOTKI based approaches. Again, we talk about the one outlier here, which is sarcomatoid histology, which tends to skew me more towards the IO, IO. But if it's a uh, uh, non-sarcomatoid standard clear cell, that's kind of my decision tree. And if it's something where I, I need to get a rapid response, I, I need to cite or reduce, or this patient's really sick, I, I veer towards the IOTKIs just because, again, with the caveat, we can do you know, comparisons between trials. They almost certainly have a higher response rate. And so that's, that's really what I'm going for. It's a high response rate, low risk of primary progressive disease. If there's uh, a patient who yes, it'd be great to get a response, but if they don't respond in the next eight or 12 weeks, it's not going to really impact their life in a meaningful way. And I'm thinking about the long-term, about durability. Um, that's why I tend to go for uh, uh, IO-based approaches. And it's not that I think IOTKIs, we, they don't necessarily have durability. I just don't think we know perfectly yet. I think with Checkmate 214, with Nevo plus Ipi, we have long-term data where we really see that flattening of the PFS curve, where we can convince ourselves that some if patients get a response, they're going to, decent chance they're going to be a response a few years later. I just don't think we have that longer-term data that's as convincing for the IOTKIs yet. So that's kind of my decision tree. Oligometastatic or not, is it non-clear cell or is it clear cell? Homotoid, and then it branches into basically long-term durability with IOIO, or if they need a, if I need a response up front, or I need a site to reduce, I want to get this person to surgery in the short term, then an IOT care. That's really wonderful. I, I mean, I think it's really important to understand sort of those clinical variables, those patient variables that are really factored into clinical decision-making when we are in the setting where we lack really robust biomarkers to guide just exactly what regimen to use. Um, for patients that are progressing after they've seen, um, you know, IO-based treatments, um, what's your strategy? Do you kind of utilize the same sort of approach, um, or, you know, how do you how do you think about therapy for those individuals? It, it's a uh, an excellent question, one where I think the landscape is changing pretty rapidly. You know, I think um, if this question was asked a couple months ago, I think there's a lot of people who would use even after an upfront IO-based strategy might use an IOTKI in a later line. And there's certainly uh, some evidence to support that. There's the phase two trial from Dr. Lee at Sloan Kettering, which showed 
showed pembrolizumab app plus lundatinib having pretty good response rates after first line IO that really, I think, provided a basis for a lot of people to think about IO post IO. I think the thing that's changed in the last couple of months, and we don't have any published data, just sort of uh, uh, you know, top line reports, publicly announced reports, which is the CONTACT-03 trial, which really tried to evaluate this in a systematic way. So for patients who had received prior IO therapy, getting randomized to a TKI by itself, cabozantinib, versus a TKI plus IO, uh, cabozantinib plus uh, atezolizumab. And so really systematically asking that question, does IO post IO help? Um, and uh, there's some caveats to this trial. Of course, it's atezolizumab is not an approved agent in kidney cancer. And I think we certainly know it's a clinically active drug. We know that back from the emotional uh, uh, 150 trial, but it still is not an approved drug. So there's caveats, but at least the top line results really don't show any benefit for the addition of IO post IO. And so I think it at least gives us a little bit of pause um, for, for using that, that sort of strategy. Personally, my approach is to go a much more conventional. Obviously, I, I always think of clinical trials and think of what is the next evolution and what's possible and, and uh, not just a uh, combination of the existing drug, but novel, novel agents as well. But for the standard patient who's not getting a clinical, who's not going to be enrolled in a clinical trial, I use a series of TKIs and cabozantinib is what I, I frequently use next, though there's a whole range of very reasonable options. Sitnib, lindatinib, plus severe alignment, and, and others. And as we get to later lines, things like tavozinib as well. And so that tends to be my progression through uh, later lines of therapy.